Bit of editor Andrew Rule. Welcome back to the run home with Joel and Fletch. Hello, boys. It's good to see you, a pair of scallywags. Uh, I suppose it's better than tight ass Tuesday. Yes. yes well, we is. did have that earlier on. Yeah, you got to mention there too, Andrew, but not by us. Um, <laughs> now, Andrew, we, I Thank understand you. you've been travelling, gallivanting, yeah, around the world. The gallivanter. Well, can't say too much. Been to Scotland. Uh, the weather there is better than in Melbourne at the minute. Yep. Uh, which is sad. Uh, even right up north in the Shetland Islands. On the way home, went into Albania. Talking oh. about. Uh, Crime places, uh, a lot of very shiny black Mercedes and Audis there, boys. Oh, okay, do tell lots of them. Yeah, why? They, what are they? Do, what are they doing there? What's their gear? Well, it's mean, nasty people allege that they're stolen in Germany and taken across to uh, places like Albania and Montenegro. But I wouldn't make that allegation. <laughs> no. What, what, what was it like though? Very nice people. What was Albania? Yeah, was was the food good? Is the uh, What's the what's the country like? Sell Albania yeah, to us. Well, I'm saying mix uh, rural Greece with rural Turkey and you know or Bulgaria. It's yeah. it's a bit of all those places. Uh, pretty quiet, sort of serious people, and I think despite their reputation for you know very tough criminality, they say that they're as tough as the Russians or or anyone else. I think on a day to day level, dealing with them in the shops and the hotels and all that, they were pretty good and pretty honest and pretty um, pretty likeable. Um, that's the way I found them. What's, a, what's, a, what's them. a lingo, Andrew, in Albania? What do they speak in Albania? Uh, it's pretty, yeah, it's Albanian. It's pretty tough stuff. It's all in Cyrillic. Right. I noticed that um, when you go to hotels there and look at the, the bookshelves where the, mm. the books are for the tourists, none of them are in English. They're all in, you know, back-to-front writing in Cyrillic. Really? Cyrillic. Okay. Now, um, now before so we get on, Russians and stuff. Yep. before we get on to the uh, topic we wish to do, which is your podcast, uh, Brian yep. and I came across Ron Idles, who's got a podcast. I'm a and, and, Oh yeah, and almost every episode, True Crime Tuesday, features you. Is that a fact? It is a fact. That is you, a fact. You come on and you give uh, Ross a bit of a. So are you and Ross mates. Ron. Ron, sorry. Ron. Oh, Ron. Ron. Uh, Ron Idle, sorry, not Ross. Not, sorry. Well, not, not really. Uh, I was probably asked to talk about Ron at some point in the past, and, yeah. you know, he was a big-time old homicide copper that solved a lot of cases and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, there's uh, mixed feelings about him now. He upset a lot of his fellow police with a particular case. and uh, which, which, became, one? Which, which one? Which one? Tell, tell us, Oh, Andrew. that was that... Um, uh, Bendali Debs and his uh, young associate. Yeah. Um, uh, that that case and yeah, yeah, yeah. Ron sort of, uh, overturned the conventional uh, police thoughts about that one, and that uh, didn't lead to many happy endings for yep. was certainly not for him. Okay. But um, I'm an agnostic about that one. But no, Ron's had a, you know he had a long and storied career, and he he did a lot of good work for a long time. And, and he's one of a pair of twins. I know he's twin. Really? Is that? Please tell me it's Ross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please tell me his name. No, is... he's not. <laughs> he's I... not. He's a he's a he's a colourful restaurant uh, personality. He oh. looks a bit like Ron, but he he doesn't he doesn't really uh, s- sort of sound like him. Oh, All right. Like, <laughs> now, a good food. Now, Andrew, I, this is the case that we spoke to you uh, not long ago, but there has been an update. This is uh, the yep. Samantha Murphy case. What do we yes. know now? Well, the police uh, in Victoria have finally take, they've decided to use the uh, federal police's dogs, these good dogs that can find um, laptops and phones and that sort of stuff, technology sniffer dogs. They brought them down for the mushroom case to find if there were any hidden laptops or phones in the mushroom lady's house. Mm. And indeed, I think they found a few. Wow. And now this time they've used them in the Samantha Murphy case. And lo and behold, uh, a couple of weeks ago, dogs led the police to a phone, to Samantha Murphy's phone, which was on the edge of a farm dam. And I'm thinking that probably it was thrown in the water or dropped in the water or something. And the water's gone down a bit, and then they've been able to find the phone. It's wow. certainly hers. Okay. So we- that is a step closer to solving where her body might be. Right. So the young gentleman that is in custody at the yep. moment, he hasn't faced court yep. yet? No, none of that's gone to 
Uh, no, he's well apart from the initial, you know, yeah. going when he was charged. You're right. No, okay. he's that'll take a fair while to see the light of day. His name is Patrick Stevenson. Yep. He's a very tall young fella, son of a very tall fella called Oren Stevenson, who played a handful of games in the, the big league down here, right. league football. So, so Andrew, Andrew Rule, sorry, sorry, Brian, yeah. is he still in custody? Yes. Yes. Okay. And do we know yeah. why they've kept him in custody? Is there any any evidence to suggest he's involved? Like, why have they got him in custody? Uh, because I think they would see him as, uh, let's be careful here, they might see him as a flight risk. Got yep. you. Okay. And they might see him as possibly someone who might do himself some self-harm. That oh, was yeah, raised hey. by his own lawyer. Right. And I think he's probably kept in custody probably well away from mainstream people in case uh, he came to some harm inside because he's a big young lad, 22-year-old, but yeah. uh, he probably isn't as mean and tough as some of the blokes behind bars. No, I could imagine. When, when they get oh, this gotcha. phone when they get this phone, and the, the dogs have retrieved this phone, can they make it work again? Like, is that the, is That's that a very good question. I think the experts are unravelling that to see what remains uh, traceable inside the phone. Yep. Well, if it's been submerged, you would wonder. Uh, but then again, it's not salt water. I think salt water might be worse for phones than fresh water. Okay. I certainly put one through a dishwasher myself once, yes. and I'll not <laughs> and it worked when it came out. Yeah, you got to throw in the rice. Well, you, you know, one, one of our uh, rugby league players, Brian, Yep. What did he do? Yeah, no, you tell the story. He he, uh, he put in a microwave. He thought that he could uh, sort it out. That... Oh, genius. Yeah. Yes. But, a Andrew, <laughs> you're renowned for, for the crime reporting, Herald Sun. Um, yeah. How did you get into this? Like, just talking about you for a moment, we're going to talk about your podcast and so forth. But, but No worries. And my book. Yeah, yeah and your book. And your... Yeah. Don't relax. We've got Life. your book covered. Life and crime. Relax. I'm yeah. relaxed. Um, how did I get into it? Well, what, what, why? How? How did you do this? Yes. Well, when you look like me, I came down from the bush a yeah. long time ago. From where? I'm from from where? Yes. From East Gippsland. Yep. And this is, I'm tipping before you were born, sadly. Yep. And I was, um, I'm I'd 35, you're probably right. 17, yeah. <laughs> 17 years old, which is 50 years ago. Wow. And I came down to uni after that. And then I went to the newspapers and said, I've had a year's work in the bush, you know, what about a job? And I talked my way into a job at the Age newspaper. Mm. And, in fact, I was offered one at the Herald as well, at the Melbourne Herald, the old Herald. And I uh, was sent, you know, they tended to go, gave me the farming round and then they sent me up to police rounds and to courts and those sort of things. And then they sent, put me on sport. Now, and I didn't know a lot about sport, but I was, I was sort of fond of racing and uh, – you know, I used to cover the footy, yep. you know, not much cricket. Um, and I soon worked out that in newspapers, the stories that everybody wanted to read, by and large, were sport and crime. Wow. And that most people would read either or both. And I noticed that, you know, sitting in a so, sort of a, um, a courtroom, but, you know, at lunchtime, a QC earning a fortune and a judge would pick up the newspaper and turn to the back page and look at, you know, whether Collingwood beat Carlton and all that sort of stuff, yeah. or the races. Yep. And I thought, well, sport and crime are what people want to read. That's what I'm going to write. So I have. Wow. Um, now, now, Andrew, can we give an, can you give us an update on the mushroom case? So this is the, the lady, the error, yeah. Erin Patterson. Patterson. Um, yep. Last time we spoke to you, you were of the opinion that they might fast track uh, the court hearing. Has that is that, um, uh, is that well, come, uh... Uh, if I said that, I'm probably wrong, I think, because it, it hasn't fast tracked. She's, um, uh, they are police homicide squad have a saying, you know, that the case will only get stronger, time will only help a, a case like theirs. He'll, he'll help her and case, uh, uh, well, I think their case, yeah. I think the homicide case, uh, but they will be getting everything very carefully checked by international experts to, to, to see if there's traces of poison mushrooms, et cetera, et cetera, wow. to build a case against her. The flip side of all that is that there's really only one person who can give a contra 
uh, version of her story, and that is the survivor of the four people who were poisoned at the infamous lunch mm. back in July last year. Uh, three of them, of course, died within days. One survived, and that man, uh, you would think, will be able to give evidence about who supplied what, you know, whether mm. anybody else brought any food to the lunch, was, you know, did somebody provide a mushroom sauce or whatever it might be. So we will probably hear two versions of what might have happened. And uh, the mushroom lady, Erin Patterson, does not entirely own the crime scene in the way that some other people uh, own the crime scene. Wow. Because there is there is a witness in this case. Oh, okay. Did Erin um, no, er, did Erin Patterson, the uh, the mushroom cook, did she say yeah. that she actually had some of this dinner as well at the start? Was there? Something- I think she. Uh, I think she has said something yeah. to that effect, and then she's also said, "Oh, you know, my children had some of the beef Wellington. The beef Wellington was the dish, but it's uh, it's not beyond belief that you know the children and she ate some beef Wellington that didn't have." Uh, the poisoned mushroom in it, right. mm. you'd think, because otherwise they would be poisoned, mm. which they are not. Far out. Can I ask you, Andrew, and uh, they're all alleged, these cases, right? Samantha Murphy, yeah, they're alleged. mushroom case, Aaron Patterson. In your mind, and you've lived in this game, as you said, for 50 years, are you pretty certain in your own mind, and it's only your own opinion, Samantha Murphy case and the mushroom case, are you fairly certain who did it on both fronts? Uh, yeah, I am, but I wouldn't be talking about it. No, you know, no, no, I no, wouldn't no, want to say no, it. No, no, but yeah, I, I've but, got but a, on both fronts, you, you are very confident. Yeah. Yes, yes. I think. I'm not asking I don't you think who. we're all thinking that the police have barked up the wrong tree and there's, you know, yep. 25 other candidates. Yeah. No. Okay. With, with the Samantha um, Murphy case, can we just go back there for a second in? Were, were they known yeah. to each other, the alleged um, gentleman? No. No, I, they're not. I, Definitely not. Definitely not. No, he's a he's a young tradie. You know, he's twenty two years old. Uh, there's, I mean, that, that wouldn't stop him from knowing the family, of course. Mm. But apparently, not known, no connection. Wow. Okay. And I don't think we should speculate about what might or might not have happened because we'd be guessing. That's right. But it it's not beyond belief that um, someone could be uh, run down in a vehicle uh, for whatever reason, uh, maybe no reason. Okay. Right. And it's not beyond possibility that they were you know under the influence of whatever it's all these things are possible Andrew let me ask you this uh the Samantha Murphy case which is a Victorian case so sometimes in New South Wales or Queensland and majority of our listening audience yeah. are from there we miss that do you mind just retracing the bullet points and why this young man is in custody do you mind just retracing that for us well no February the 4th, Sunday morning this this year, uh, Samantha Murphy, uh, 51-year-old mother of uh, at least one child, mm. uh, wife and mother, so, substantial sort of um, panel beaters, the, the husband. He's got a good job, Mick Murphy. Uh, a, a good business, I mean, yeah. not a job, yeah, a business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these people have got a big, good house on a little a bit of acreage, a sort of hobby farm territory on the edge of Ballarat. Pretty good setup. She's a pretty fit woman, goes running every day, I think, and she was, went running that morning, Sunday morning, 7 a.m., never came back. Mm. They contact the police later in the day and the searches begin uh, and it's everybody starts searching for her. Within a couple of weeks, the police declare it suspicious. Well, you know, mm. it was. Yep. And uh, on it went from there. People kept searching, no sign, no sign, no sign. And uh, eventually uh, the breakthrough came when the police arrested this young fella um, many weeks later. Uh, it, it was a, a long time. I can actually knock off the date here somewhere, but uh, it was why, many Andrew, weeks why, why, why? Why was he the one? And this is all facts that have been tended to the court. Yeah. Why was he the one? Uh, that's a good question. That might be... We're probably delving into things that are going to be aired in court. Right. Okay. Um, but but let's let's go general here. Yeah. yeah the of police, course. the police are very good these days at mm. using telephone, mobile telephone technology. Yep. By and large, that's their big thing. Plus security camera footage. Gotcha. 
in this case, I'd suggest that uh, mobile phone technology would be their friend yep. and would be, they would be able to isolate, uh, as they have in some other cases, uh, some other high-profile cases, they'd be able to isolate which, which people were where, when, on the night in question or right. on the day in question, the morning okay. in question. But, but, Andrew, just for our listening audience, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm yep. asking for your opinion, everything's alleged, but yes. is there a reason as to why? Is there a motive that's been publicly announced? Um, no, there's been a lot of rumours, and I would suggest probably vicious and probably baseless rumours yep. about uh, allegations of all sorts of you know connections that yep. uh, Bikey set it up because of X Y Z, all yes. that sort of stuff. I would tend to view those rumours very sceptically uh, until proven otherwise, and I suspect that this um, this act. Uh, may well have just happened without any mm. prior um, planning and yeah. uh, could have just happened off the cuff. Yeah, gotcha. So could, so That's could not take it past that. So I it, don't actually know. No, no. Talk. But, um, Andrew, when will it go to court? Because this, this kid, rightly or wrongly, yeah, guilty, he's in custody. guilty or, or not guilty, how long does he stay in custody for and could it be three years before it, they, um, oh. he goes to court? I, I would have thought there'd be a committal hearing. Um, I would have thought a committal hearing, you know, later this year, and then uh, it'll will kick on from there. If a, if a magistrate sees fit to commit him to trial, then away it goes after that. Right. If not, he's home free. Yeah. Andrew, uh, your book is Life and Crimes, uh, which will come out later this month. Uh, tell us about yep. that. A collection of uh, a lot of. Stories that I've done over the years. Mm. It's probably twenty odd stories in it. What's your biggest story, Some Andrew? Of... What's your biggest story? Well, bigger story. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, there's some oldies and goldies. It goes. <laughs> the, I think the last story in the book is the Beaumont children, which wow. you know has yeah. been around. Yeah. When I was a little boy, learning, basically reading newspapers for the first time as a ten-year-old yeah. or whatever, nine-year-old, um, the Beaumont case was the biggest story in the country and mm. I've never forgotten it. And, you know, all these years later I got to write about it. And now both Jim and Nancy Beaumont in South Australia um, have died in extreme old age, wow. never knowing what happened yeah. to their three children who vanished from a busy beach at Glenelg all those years ago on Australia Day 1966. That's, it's a haunting story. It's an, an astonishing thing. It's just one of the, the biggest cases ever in Australia, without doubt. It captured the public attention. It happened the same month. Uh, sorry, it happened just a couple of weeks before Australia went to decimal currency in February. You know, So it happened Australia Day, 66. Wow. Decimal currency came in on the 14th of February. So it was that few weeks, that summer, that Australia changed from the old world to the new world and, you know, here we have this terrible crime. Andrew, it's going to be a bestseller because, uh, as you say, pe people love this stuff. Life and Crimes, the book is coming out. Andrew Rule is the author, of course, uh, Collated Crimes. But yeah, this is to what finish I... on a high, Brian, yep. take take us to the thoroughbred Tell land. Tell us about this, a horse named Winx, yeah. Andrew. A horse named Winx. Yes. I'm pleased you ask. It's not all doom and gloom. Documentary. This, uh, I, was, I was asked to help with the make this documentary feature by an excellent filmmaker, Jan Janine Hosking, mm. who's made a lot of other stuff. She's not a sports uh, person. She's not a person who knows anything about racing, but she's a very fine filmmaker. She approached me about it, and I said, well, if you get me, you don't need the book, because I am the book. I wrote the book about Winx. <laughs> yeah. And she said, I've yeah, good idea. So we did it. Uh, Winx, the um, most excellent biography, which uh, is uh, uh, still available, I believe. Yeah. And... Uh, We've gone and done it, and she's she is a terrific filmmaker, and she's managed to take a story. Everyone knows the ending, you know. Winks won thirty three races straight and twenty five million or whatever it was, and she's she's made it fresh and new and different with the way she's edited it and the way she's used music, but she's also found hidden depths in the story, and that is since Winks gave up racing, yeah. since since Winks gave up racing, hey. she has. Oh, Andrew, Andrew. 
with Mrs. With Cruel. Mrs. I know. That we're going to have to let you go, go, Andrew. But Sorry, we're mate. we're back. True Crime Tuesday. What? And um, we have... It is True Crime Cru- Tuesday. And I don't mean to uh, disrespect what we're doing, but we have kidnapped we have. a guest. Yep. What have we done? Well, usually Andrew, who's a busy man... Yeah. We had him for 20 minutes. Yep. We had him for 25 minutes. We had him for 27 minutes. Well, we're we having what? so much fun, don't we? We've got him for another 30 minutes. No, oh, we not. haven't got another 30. <laughs> no, he's no, shak- no, he's shaking his head. And, Andrew, we, we cut you off. Um, I know we've got, we've got the book, but our listeners what, want to no, know. Hang on, Brian. Life and crimes. No, but, but take the curtains back. Why did we cut him off? And he understands this. Because he was in radio. He, he understands was, this. Yes. Hard out. Hard out. We've got to get to the news. Okay, oh. let's get to a hard man yeah. about a hard out. Okay, now, Andrew, you were talking about Winks. Let's uh, talk about um, this documentary that you've uh, written. Yep. And, and you're the uh, uh, and you're uh, the voice. As well. He's yeah. the voice. A horse named Winks. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a lovely thing, and it's not predictable because the last half hour of a two hour film mm. uh, tells you the story behind the story of how Winks went to stud and almost died, foaling, oh. and went underwent two big operations which were expected uh, to leave her struggling for her life. Wow! She survived against the odds and. There wasn't a dry eye in the house at the at the premiere in Sydney um, ten days ago. Uh, people clapped and cheered and whistled, and some of them were in tears mm. watching this thing. I was so moved by it, and um, some of the performance. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm pretty ordinary. Look at me, but <laughs> some of the performances in this it's a documentary, and mm. these people are just talking. But Chris Waller is is terrific. Hugh Bowman is wonderful. I don't think there's a jockey who's a more, uh, a, you know, a better interview subject because he doesn't talk in cliches. Mm. He tells you the truth and he tells it uh, steadily and calmly. And then there's cameos from all these other people, including this Indian bloke called Amir, who was the first guy ever to ride winks. He broke her in. He helped her wow. out. <laughs> hey, so wow. you've, got, you've got cameos from all over the shop and um, things that, that I didn't know about Winks have bobbed up in this documentary. Things I didn't know about Waller and Bowman bob up in the documentary. It really is enormously moving and enormously good. Chatting to Andrew Rule from the, from the Herald Sun, from the Herald Sun, and Andrew, arguably one of the greatest thoroughbreds to grace our turf. Yes. A- and I've got the book at home. It's, it's the big font of the blue of Winks. And yep. you, you've written the book, you're the narrator, from your personal professional point of view, when you're asked to do that, tell us about how that played out and what an absolute bloody honour that is. Well, it is. I, look, I was a pinch hitter. I think there was a, a very fine Sydney uh, writer, Journo, uh, mm. lined up to do the book and they hit a hurdle. I forget what happened, but there was some problem and he couldn't do it. And I got a call from a publisher up there wow. who knew me because I'd done the Terry Stokes book. Mm. And they said, do you think you could write a book about Winx? I said, yeah, I could, you know, because I, as a kid, I rode a bit of work and I rode in picnic races and stuff. So I know a little more about horse flesh than a lot of journos do. Not, not a lot. I don't no. know as much as real racing people, obviously. But I knew enough to be able to write a book about it. And, um, and that's what I did. I went and talked to all the people. I went to New Zealand. I, I did the whole thing. Where can we see the documentary? It is it in theatres or is it going to be... Theatres, yep. On Cinema those... release. Yep, okay. It's like an Amy Winehouse or, or Ant and Senna, that sort of stuff. You know, gotcha, it's... yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, hey, Andrew, can I ask you the really question? Good. And you can see the doco, of course, the Winx documentary, and it's going to be unbelievable. But can I debunk or prove a theory where Christine yep. Bowman, now known as Christine Bowman, who's from Ireland... She yep. was thinking about going to America or going to Australia, and she flipped a coin. It lands up on heads or tails, whatever the case may be, ends up in Australia, and therefore the sliding doors of life, she marries Hugh yep. Bowman. Is that fact or fiction? I have heard that story, and I have no reason not to believe it. Yeah. Uh, and no reason not to believe it. She's, um, she's a funny one. She's a knockabout, tough little girl. Mm. Uh, and... Uh, they're an interesting crew. The whole thing's Huey's parents. They're old-time farmers from up at Don- Dunny Doo near uh, Dubbo somewhere. Yeah. And very one, uh, lovely people. Um, Chris Waller's parents, I met them. His father has since passed away. 
I met his parents in New Zealand and they were terrific. I met a lot of very nice people in, you know, pursuing the background to Winks. It's, it's all in the book. Yeah. Yep. Lots of it. I took the scenic route because horses can't talk, boys. No, no, that's, right. Can't talk. <laughs> that's, no. that's right. Wish some of them could. Yeah. Like my horse. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to your horse? No, nah, I'm not talking about it. Just went backwards. To- Toby Dow from True Crime Tuesday said, let's talk about the horse. No, no, that is a crime. Yeah. That is a crime. Second last. Andrew, thank you very much. Just one more thing. Where can we get Life and Crimes, the book? Where are we we're online. Uh, that book is. That one, Life and Crimes, yep. black cover with yellow writing. It is hitting every decent uh, bookshop and a lot of bad ones right around <laughs> Australia. Uh, in, as we speak, there are trucks backing into loading bays, oh, good. loading them into yeah. shops yep. or right across the wide brown land. Andrew Rule, as you know, as you know, uh, we are the staple. We're the home of everything True Crime Tuesday. So whenever you shall wish to promote a book, yep. talk about something that's happened in your life, you must call this number. Click on the icon and we'll be yes. here, won't we, Brian? Absolutely. I'm oh, looking at that wardrobe yeah. behind you, those clothes there. They could tell some stories. Oh, well, Brian. Right, oh, yeah, thanks for that. For Look those watching that. on YouTube. Like rubby little study. For those watching on YouTube, share with Andrew what you've done this week. Okay, so, Andrew, I got told that we only wear 20% of mm. our wardrobe. Yes. That's what I got told. Yes. I don't know yep. about you, um, but I culled I, over the weekend. I culled. Down to fifty yep. percent of the stuff. So, and there, you're right, or that this person was right. Yeah. I had some stuff in there oh. that it was just shit yeah. house. Yeah, I know. And uh, look, I took some stuff down to the uh, to the op shop the other day, and yeah. I it was a suit I bought in London, and you know, twenty eight years ago or something, and the pants were moth eaten. Why, <laughs> why, why do we Why do we keep it? Why do, it's not sentimental. Like it cost me a lot of money at the time. I know yeah. we just keep it. I don't know. It's tight yeah. ass Tuesday, but I've do, I, I suggest you cull. That's what I want you to do. I've Andrew. got a cull. You cull. So I've got just a cull. look look over your right shoulder right now, Andrew. For those yeah. looking on YouTube, how many of those clothes have you not worn? Oh, you're right. There's suits there. There's yeah. suits. I've got suits from back when I used to Correct. go into a, you know a, yeah. a, an assault, a, a deputy editor or something. Yeah. I used to wear suits and ties. Yeah. I haven't worn them for years. Yep. Yeah, let's get rid of them. Yep. Straight down the op shop. Them. Yep, Chris Straight Cullen. Up yep. shop. Up shop it. Andrew, thank you very much for your time. I know you're a busy busy man. We're going to uh, plug I this am. book. I've got seven grandkids. Oh, oh, oh two yeah. more. Oh, Boom. Nice work. Boom. Welcome any time, Andrew. Welcome any time. Uh, we love you coming here on the run home with Joel no and Fletch for True Crime Tuesday. Thank you very much, Andrew Rule, Herald you, Son of